system. Um, when we, recording. <laughs> and so as we kind of, you know, work through uh, the conversation here today, I'm really looking forward to kind of talking about some of the growth sectors um, as it pertains to business and entrepreneurship, um, really looking at the diversity, the inclusion, um, talking about the employment dynamics, right? Because when you're talking about economic development as a whole, um, it's really about job creation in, in, in simple terms. And so our small businesses um, are roughly about 50 percent of who employs our workforce here in L.A. County. And so the LADC, um, our whole mission and our whole value is really about inclusive economic development, working and utilizing and leveraging our five pillar economic strategy, which includes business assistance, uh, research, industry cluster development, foreign direct investment through our World Trade Center LA, um, and then finally bringing all of that full circle is workforce development. So looking forward to a thriving uh, conversation here today and thank you all so much. And again, thank you to our partners. Thank you to the LARC for the opportunity and working together um, to really impact the community colleges. And so thank you. Thanks so much, Jermaine. Um, next up, we have Matthew, who is the GIS Research Analyst here at LADC with the Institute for Applied Economics. All right. Thank you, Alicia. And good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Skyberg. And as Alicia said, I'm the GIS Research Analyst for the IAE with LAEDC. And today I'm going to be sharing several aspects of the industry, including the current landscape of industry employment, anticipated future employment, job posting trends, and finally, industry worker demographics. Uh, so as we can see, industry employment is measured using a NAICS four-digit code of 5412, which includes accounting, tax preparation, bookkeeping, and payroll services. And within this industry group, there's uh, four six-digit NAICS national industries or sub-industries, which include offices of certified public accountants, tax preparation services, payroll services, and other accounting services. Uh, next slide. So we'll start with the current landscape in the industry. As we can see, the industry has employed over 50,000 people each year between 2012 and 2022. And payroll employment was highest in 2013 with more than 57,000 jobs. Um, payroll employment fell to its lowest point in 2020 at just over 50,500 jobs. But since 2020, employment has increased almost 9%, adding 4,400 new jobs in that two-year period. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we look at employment distribution and how it's changed from 2012 to 2022, the offices of CPAs maintained the largest share of employment, and it actually grew 5.1 percentage points between 2012 and 22 to over 36 percent. Other accounting services is also growing modestly to 26.6 percent, becoming the second largest industry share. Well, payroll services actually shrunk its employment by 7.5 percentage points to become the third largest industry share. Uh, the employment of tax preparation services has grown modestly and remains the lowest share of employment. And payroll services was the only industry subsector to decrease its share of employment in this time. All right, next slide. So as we look at the average annual pay, each sub-industry had average annual earnings that exceeded the MIT living wage threshold. Uh, payroll services was the highest at over 194,000, which is over four times the living wage threshold. And compared to all industries in LA County, they were around 84,000 per year in this time. Um, accounting, tax preparation, bookkeeping, and payroll services industry as a whole was 124,850. And the professional, scientific, and technical services sector, which is uh, which accounting, tax preparation, bookkeeping, and payroll services is included in, was at one twenty six, just over one hundred twenty six thousand a year. So it's it's very competitive with that. All right, next slide. So as we look at real wage growth, um, so wages grew at varying rates across the sub industries from twenty twelve to twenty twenty two. You can see that payroll services had the largest uh, growth at sixty five percent. And tax preparation services also had significant growth at nearly nineteen percent. Well, offices of CPAs and other accounting services experienced slower growth at five point seven and three point two percent. So overall, the the industry is growing at nearly twenty four percent. 24%, which is outpacing the professional scientific and technical services industries 
by 19 percentage points. So this is a industries that are growing um, at very good rates. Okay, next slide. As we look at forecast employment, we can see that payroll employment is expected to grow from just under 55,000 jobs to over 57,150 jobs in 2028. That's an increase of approximately 4% and adding 2,175 new jobs in this time period, which is works out to about 360 new jobs per year. Okay, next slide. So although the industry is expected to grow 4%, the, the growth is not uniform across all sub-industries. As we can see, offices of CPAs is expected to have the highest rate of growth at 10.2%. Payroll services expected to have the second highest rate of growth at 6.8, while tax preparation services is expected to have modest growth at just under 1%. And other accounting services is the only sub-industry um, expected to have decline at 5.6%. Next slide. So as we look at employer job postings, the job postings peaked in 2022 at over 14,500 unique job postings. Um, in the time period from 2012 to 22, the, the growth hasn't been steady. There's been some dips, but we can see that it's been significant in this time period nonetheless. And the offices of certified public accountants industry represents the largest share of job postings over the last decade, where they account for over 53%. Well, payroll services and other accounting industries were were number two and three at eighteen point seven and seventeen point four percent, respectively. Next slide. So, as we look at the job postings uh, by year for these sub industries, we can see that the offices of CPAs has been the subsector with the most job postings every year. Well, the other three sub industries have, have been kind of trading places over that decade. Um, the offices of certified public accountants and other accounting services has been in trending up since 2017, while tax preparation services and payroll services has been trending slightly down since 2019. Okay, next slide. So as we look at the sub-industries growth uh, year to year uh, job postings, we can see that tax preparation services, which is in dark red, has had the most variability since 2012, experiencing some years with growth over 340% and also years of decline exceeding 50%. Um, offices of CPAs have also experienced significant variability, approaching 100% growth, but also having years of over 20% decline. While payroll services and other accounting services have been the most stable, averaging just over 8% annual growth rate in this time period. Next slide. So as we look at the top six companies overall in the accounting tax preparation, bookkeeping and payroll services industry, we can see that the, the postings are highly concentrated in these six companies as they account for just over half at 51%. These companies include PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is an international firm delivering assurance, tax, and advisory services. KPMG, which is financial audit, tax, and advisory services. H&R Block, which is tax preparation. ADP, which is payroll and accountant software services. Ernst Young, who is primarily provides assurance tax and informational technology services and Viacom, which has since been acquired by CBS. Next slide. So as we look at the sub-industries and their concentration of job postings in the top five companies, we can see that payroll services and tax preparation services are the highest concentrated with over 80% of the postings coming from their top five companies. Um, Offices of CPAs is also highly concentrated with over 70% of the postings coming from the top five companies. While other accounting services is the only sub-industry where the top five companies account for less than half of the, of the job postings. Next slide. <clears throat> so now we'll turn to the industry demographics and starting with workers age. So you can see that over 48% of employees are between ages of 25 and 44 years old, which is about 4% more than other industries in LA. 
And workers that are 65 years or older are, are also five percentage points higher compared to other industries in LA. And the workers between ages of 45 to 64 are over two percentage points higher compared to other industries in LA County. So there's uh, fewer workers under the age of 25 and then it's kind of distributed out to the other age groups. So there's, there's a high percentage of workers that are either retirement age or approaching that is higher than the average, but there's also a, a high volume of workers 25 to 44 in that target work age. Next slide. So looking at the education level of workers, we can see that about 19% of workers have a bachelor's degree, which is nearly 8% less than other industries in LA County. There's also a higher proportion of employees with a high school diploma are equivalent. Some college experience are associate's degree with over 53% of employees um, meeting that compared to just over 46% in all other industries in LA County. Next slide. Uh, the race and ethnicity of workers, we can see that half the workers report their ethnicity as white, which is over 15 percentage points higher than the all industry average in LA County. Hispanic or Latino workers are underrepresented uh, with only 20.7% compared to 30 over 39% across all industries. The Asian and Pacific Islander workers are slightly overrepresented at nearly three percentage points higher compared to all industries. Well, black or African American workers are slightly underrepresented by nearly one percentage point compared to all industries in LA County. And looking at the gender of workers, the gender distribution is is actually skewed female compared to the county average, which skews slightly male. So over 53% um, of the workforce is female, which is nearly 5% higher than all industries in LA County. Next slide. So now we'll turn to some target occupations and, and their associated demographics. The occupations identified in this table are accessible to workers with community college level education. Um, we can see that 40 to 49% of workers in these occupations are middle skill workers with education attainment of more than high school diploma or equivalent, but less than a bachelor's degree. And these occupations include tax repairs, first line supervisors of office and administrative support workers, billing and posting clerks, bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks, payroll and timekeeping clerks, and general office clerks. The, on the demographic side, the Hispanic workers are most underrepresented in tax repairs and bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks, where they're right around 30% compared to over 39% in all industries. Tax repairs have the highest concentration of workers 65 years and older at 31%. So that's a very significant uh, majority, or significant amount of the workers. And that compares to just under 9% across all industries. Male workers are underrepresented across most of these occupations mostly in the bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks at only 12.5%, and the billing and posting clerks where they account for only 12.7% of workers. And, uh, oh, sorry, one more there. White workers are also most overrepresented in bookkeeping, auditing, and accounting, and the tax preparers occupations, where they're, they exceed 42% in both those compared to 35% in all industries in LA. Okay. So looking at some of the key takeaways, we can see the employment increased nearly 9% from 2020 to 2022, adding 4,400 new jobs. The real wages have grown over 23% in the industry between 2012 and 2022. And offices of CPA saw a 5.1 percentage point increase in employment share making it the largest or maintaining the largest industry share. Well, payroll services experienced a 7.5% point decrease over the same period. Overall employment industry is projected to grow by 4% from 2022 to 2028, which will add over 2,175 new jobs. And leading the way is offices of, of certified public accountants, which is expected to see a growth of 10.2%. 
And then job postings peaked in 2022 with over 14,530 with offices of CPAs representing the largest share, accounting for over 53% of total postings in this period. And over 48% of employees are between 25 and 44 years old, um, which is a good sign. And the workforce is also slightly skewed female with over 53% identifying as female. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you all for your, your time and attention. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me at matthew.skyberg at laedc.org, and I would be happy to engage with you there. All right, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, next up, we have Luke Meyer, who is the director of the Los Angeles Center of Excellence for Labor Market Research, has said about stuff. All right. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Alicia. And thank you to all of our employers for uh, for joining the call. I know that you're very busy, but hopefully after April the 15th, which we strategically waited for, uh, maybe a little less busy on the on the tax side. And thanks for all of our faculty to get here. So I'll go through our program side, our supply side at the 19 community colleges in L.A., uh, and then we can get to our discussion talking about, you know, what our curriculum is teaching versus what is needed in the labor market. So looking at our 19 community colleges in LA, all 19 of them have accounting programs. Uh, some of the illustrative examples are for certified bookkeepers, CPA exam prep, uh, the basics of tax for small businesses, payroll administration, uh, accounting for government and nonprofits, and uh, focused on um, QuickBooks and others. And then we have six of our colleges there on the right uh, with tax studies programs. The table beneath that shows the number of awards from the most recent three-year period. Uh, it combined average just over 1,100 awards per year. That includes uh, uh, associate degrees and certificates and some non-credit awards as well. Next slide. All right, it's a little small, but that's the uh, enrollment patterns over the last 10 years, the last decade uh, from this uh, these programs, accounting. So you can see in the most recent year, uh, 24,000, just under 500, 24, 500 uh, students. So we have a lot of students in these pathways. Next. And when we look at the enrollment patterns by college, you can see Santa Monica, San Antonio, Mount San Antonio, our host college, and uh, Pasadena City College, all enrolling over 2,000 students. And there's only five uh, colleges that have fewer than 1,000 enrollments. So we have a lot of students in these pathways. Next. Looking Luke, at the student demographic. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Just to understand relative to overall population, what percentage of students roughly are you seeing in accounting versus other fields or where does accounting fall in the highest to lowest? Great question. Accounting is one of the larger programs. Uh, I, I believe, please don't quote me on this, but I think that most recent year that we show there uh, just over, is it 200,000 CTE students? So this is a, this is a significant chunk of them. Good question. Uh, and in terms of student demographics, just over half are female, uh, half identify as Hispanic, and you can see that more than half are 29 years or younger. So they are, are young and um, uh, ready for the workforce. Next. Looking at student employment outcomes over the next four slides, uh, this first is a a self-report data measure from our Career Technical Education Outcome Survey, where students are asked, "Are is your job you're working in now closely related to your field of study, yes or no? And in the most recent year that data was collected, uh, students exiting accounting programs, more than eight out of every 10 are reporting working in their field of study, which is higher than the average across all programs of 73%. And you can see that has increased over time. So more students using their uh, education in their job. Next. The median change in earnings, this compares what students were making prior to entering the program with what they're making now. The accounting programs are in blue compared to all CTE programs in red. You can see the lines vary from at the low end when, when the earlier data was collected to students increasing their earnings 16, 17%, not by a great deal. 
climbing up to all the way to 30% in 2015-16 uh, for all programs and accounting programs were just behind that by four percentage points. And most recently, students uh, increasing their earnings by 22% exiting accounting programs. Next. The median annual earnings after exiting, accounting again in blue, all program average in red. So the most recent year, students are earning just under $41,000 per year. Uh, this data is collected from the unemployment insurance wage file through California EDD and matched uh, with, with our students exiting. So that is about uh, five to $6,000 higher than the average across all programs. Next. And then the percentage of students who attain the living wage. Ideally, this would be 100 uh, across the board, right? Uh, but in the most recent year, just over half students, half of accounting students are earning a living wage. Uh, and for, compared to 45% across all programs. Now, at the time that this data was collected, the living wage was $18.10 per hour uh, for the most recent year available. Next. Uh, these are the target occupations that, that Matt went through. Uh, here's some additional data points. Uh, you got 2022 jobs. The, the ones in blue are, are, are sort of middle skill occupations that our students can, can uh, get into upon leaving programs. The ones in red are, are pathway occupations. Those all require a baccalaureate degree. So if students want to continue their education, those are jobs that they could be eligible for. But you see the size of occupation uh, in 2022, how many jobs there were in LA County, and then the uh, five-year change after that. The average annual openings in the center of the screen show how many uh, new jobs plus how many replacement needs there will be. So that's average annual job openings per job. And then the earnings we have at the 25th percentile for hourly earnings, the median hourly earnings, and then the, the annual earnings. And this is based off of QCEW data, which captures nearly 98% of all employment in the county. Uh, this is all, by the way, contained in the lookbook for this. So I'll get through this. Uh, you can look at that lookbook anytime so we can get to the discussion. Next slide, please. All right, the last thing we'll do is look at job postings related to those occupations. Uh, so the occupation with the most job postings was bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks, uh, with just under 10,000 over the last year. And combined, uh, these occupations accounted for 24,604 postings during the last year. Next. These are the commonly reported job titles from job postings. So from office assistants, bookkeepers, accounting clerks, payroll specialists, accounts receivable specialists. And then you can see the employers over there uh, picked up a lot of, of staffing companies uh, denoted by the, the uh, asterisk there. Um, and I see H&R Block for, for, for tax purposes there as well. Next. And then the average wage trend over the next 12 months, uh, or excuse me, not over the next, over the 12 months that we looked at. Uh, these, these positions are advertising wages around $51,000 per year. So that's above the living wage for our students. And unsurprisingly, the vast majority of these postings are based in LA, followed by Long Beach, Pasadena, and Torrance. Uh, I believe that is the last slide. Uh, so if you have questions about any of this, my contact information is there. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us and let's get to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Luke, appreciate it. Next, we're gonna move on to the roundtable discussions. Um, just some little housekeeping rules. Please mute yourself throughout the discussion. Um, if you have any questions, we're actually gonna ask you to submit it in the chat box, but there will be time towards the end where you'll be able to engage with the employers as well. So please, we'll leave room for that as well. So next up, I'm gonna introduce all the employers here. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Perfect, so we have Aura. So Aura leads the education and workforce development pillar in Deloitte's purpose and DEI office and serves as the art organization's WEX tax U.S. India leader. Throughout her 20 years with Deloitte, Aura has multiple roles, including regional talent leader and senior manager of strategic operations and learning and development. She's passionate about equitable workforce opportunities and speaks publicly on learning and development, leadership and talent development, as well as workforce development initiatives. 
Next up, we have Trevor Jones, who is a senior manager, of state and uh, local tax, is a seasoned tax professional with over a decade of experience, including four years at a big four accounting firm. He specializes in sale, use tax, consulting, audit defense, refund claims, and automation, specializing in various client services within sales and use tax and other state and local tax domains. Trevor brings extensive experience across diverse sectors, including retail, technology, manufacturing, entertainment, and healthcare. He assists uh, taxpayers in recovering overpayments, obtaining refunds, mitigating tax risks through strategic measures, as well as voluntary disclosure agreements and tax planning. Um, we also have Vindia, who is the principal and partner at KPMG US. Vindia has 18 years of experience designing innovative technology strategies, managing major IT business transformations, and solving complex risk, compliance, Privacy and security challenges. Vindia has led development of K, uh, KPMG's GRC services and point of view, including strategic and go to market plan for services within US markets, developed and trained high functioning delivery teams. And lastly, we have Miguel, who is currently the director of Department of Work, um, Public Works at the city of Los Angeles. Um, in the Office of Accounting. He oversees a team of over 50 professionals handling all aspects of accounting, reporting, and compliance related to city operations. During his 24-year career with the City of Los Angeles, um, Miguel has served in various positions, including operational, compliance, and ERP implementation and upgrade assignments. So next up, we're gonna go over the roundtable discussions. That's gonna be uh, first in, uh, moderated by Jose. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, let's get started. So I just want to echo once before we begin. Uh, thank you one more time to the panelists for taking the time to joining uh, in this discussion for the faculty and deans uh, for taking the time and commitment to your students. So uh, in the essence of time, we'll, we'll get started. So uh, there was a lot of great information that I captured uh, throughout the presentation. For me, one of the things that stood out was that real wages grow has grown roughly 23%, which which is uh, amazing. A lot of these opportunities also lead to sustainable wages, which is something that we're trying to do here is making sure we build equitable pipelines uh, that lead to sustainable wages. So the first question, I would love to open it up to all the panelists and begin with Ara. Ara, um, I know you state in, in, in your bio, you have great experience over 20 years with Deloitte, uh, and you had multiple roles, including regional talent uh, leader and senior manager. Uh, so curious to kind of hear your thoughts on what the community colleges need to know about the current state and emerging trends of uh, the accounting and tax industry. So the floor is yours. Well, I guess this is the blessing and the curse of having a last name that starts with A, right? <laughs> good, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here with everybody and really looking forward to the, uh, the discussion and hearing from others as well. Um, at Deloitte, you know, for the last, I'd say, two to three years, we've really been focused on um, skills first and non-degree talent and really opening and broadening um, our efforts um, for lots of good, re great reasons. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm again, looking forward to the conversation. I think what we have found within audit and tax itself um, for a firm the size of ours, it's, it's, I'll call it the most challenging only because the broader trajectory does require CPA licensing. Um, you know, kind of call it out of our control piece. And so I'm looking forward. I hear, I see Luke nodding. Um, so I, I, I think that there's going to be similarity in some of these, but I think the conversation really, um, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't need to stop there. It certainly is just a starting point around kind of the, the opportunities. I think that one of the interesting opportunities that I feel is there for us all to consider, and I'd love to hear from um, the, the faculty as well is just the focus on technology today. I think that's an equalizer in a world that has ha had, you know, um, challenges and certainly gaps and, and um, missed opportunities and pathways for many. Um, but in today's ever-changing world and the increased dependency on technology and, and with, you know, the hot topic around AI, um, I think there's an opportunity to really bring um, and have that be the equalizer for students to know more and be able to leverage differently um, 
in because no one has that experience, right? So I, I'm not sure that I directly answered your question, Jose, and I probably posed more questions. But I think, you know, I would say we're all in on a community strategy, stra community college strategy. We've been working really closely in, in my role as national, so very closely with the CUNY systems in New York through the NYJCC and some, you know, Dallas College in Dallas. Um, so we've been doing lots of pilot testing. Um, but, and really looking to forward to broadening that. But I think there's opportunities and there are challenges. No, thank you so much for getting us started. You brought some key points. AI is definitely a topic we'll get into. And then posing questions, great. I think that engages the faculty to allow them some feedback towards the end. But uh, I want to segue to Trevor. Uh, Trevor, um, I know you had some ex experience with uh, four of the major accounting firms. So curious to hear your thoughts on the current state and emerging trends of, of the industry. Well, just to kind of level set here, just to start off, I'm I'm a byproduct of the community college system in California. I, uh, you know, went to my first two years of college. Uh, we're, we're at uh, a community college in Northern California, and then I graduated from UC Davis and was a transfer student, and then went back to community colleges to, uh, to uh, get the coursework that was needed to pass the CPA exam. So, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but I would just say, you know, in terms of, you know, current state and emerging trends, what we, what I've seen a lot of is that, you know, it, with all the emphasis on technology, you know, at the end of the day, accounting is still a very people oriented business. And we've had a lot of people exit the profession. And on the other side, we've also seen less people coming into it. So less college students coming in. And, you know, we have, you know, seasoned people who have who have just flat out exited the profession. So uh, meanwhile, the need and the demand for CPAs and accounting work just feels like it just continues to grow. So there's more and more compression on people who are in the in the business. So I, I, I think, you know, the, knowing that this is, you know, very much an, an in-demand career and people and that still needs people it's not going away you know the theme for people is just not going away i think is a is a big takeaway um you know obviously in the last few years we've experienced a lot of different shakeups in terms of the way everybody works um so i mean it, what we've experienced just at rsm is that you know we've i think we've come to kind of this middle ground on hybrid work and, you know, hybrid work, I think, is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. And so that ability to be flexible in terms of in-person work and remote work is um, just basically a, a trend that just keeps um, keeps kind of reinforcing itself. So um, those are kind of some of the top things that I see from my perspective. No, great points, Trevor, and, and thank you so much for sharing uh, your journey uh, within the community college system. Appreciate that. So uh, I'd like to segue to Binda. Jose, could I yes. just jump in real quickly? I'm so sorry. I want to clarify something that Trevor said and my comment. My comments around technology were not at all to say the demand won't be there. It's actually quite the contrary. I agree with Trevor's comments. The demand will continue to increase. There's an opportunity, though, to train and educate um, our students differently to have them be prepared for work that we are we are not prepared for at this time, right? Because it will just create a change. That's all I, I just want to clarify. No, thank you for adding that. I think, again, having a vast uh, experience across the panel brings in different um, opportunity to kind of reflect. So thank you for that. And I, uh, I'd like to give you some time to kind of have your input. Yeah, no, I echo my colleagues' thoughts, both Ara and Trevor. Um, I think the the key thing that we are seeing is, you know, while the demand is there, the, the skill sets have become a little bit more nuanced that we're looking for. We're not only looking for someone who understands accounting, but someone who understands accounting in the modern day context of use of technology in the context of use of AI, in the context of cyber and all of the regulations that are coming down the pike. So I think the, the skill set has become a little bit more nuanced in terms of what, what we see as a need from our clients and we see as a need from the profession itself. And I, I think, uh, you know, colleges like community colleges are stepping up to that challenge by adding a lot of these areas in the course curriculum. Um, and I, where I see the need from us as, as employers is to work very collaboratively with the colleges in designing the courses that can become 
real from day one when the students come on board. Um, the other, uh, I would say, trend that I'm seeing, of course, for, you know, it's probably not just for accounting and tax professionals, but all across the board is, um, you know, the generation that's coming into the workforce right now are demanding hybrid work environment. Uh, they are demanding, again, accounting and tax are not professions that you see as good work-life balance. I think, uh, you know, so that continues to be one of the challenge in attracting the talent and workforce. Uh, but, you know, the professional firms are addressing to that challenge by making sure that you know, there is a good work-life balance and we are providing that hybrid work environment and are also providing tools and templates to help these professionals, um, you know, meet the needs that they have both professionally as well as personally. Uh, so that's definitely another trend that I've seen just in terms of, you know, uh, professionals asking for that as they are joining some of these high demand careers. Thank you for that. It seems like a consistent trend that um, adapting to the new environment is something high high importance for for the panelists. So, Miguel, would like to kind of hear your thoughts uh, on the question. Um, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, it's it's been really quite challenging for us, uh, City of Los Angeles. I mean, as as you know, it's like we're very constrained by by unions, uh, where actually it's very difficult for us to just like quickly hire. Um, however, we really experienced uh, a lot of attrition during the pandemic pandemic years. However, we're able to offer hybrid work, which is actually, which is great, uh, and a lot of the employees responded very well. But I, I think I, I echo what everyone's saying and and their challenges. It's just it's just the most recent speaker said that just the the new wave of workers. I mean, they have different expectations, little by little. The old guard is moving away from from their assignments, and we're actually coming into the new with the new with the new generations, and they have different sets of expectations. But one thing that I've noticed is uh, the understanding the understanding of government, and I think that uh, my my emphasis is is try to make sure my 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 staff actually gets the that understanding of what their role is within the the larger context of government. And, and that's very that's something that I don't see them coming in with. They're very good at technical skills. However, those skills that translate more on a to a community com community based deliverables, uh, for example, fiscal fluency, how to translate some of the unique terminology that uh, government utilizes, right? To them, as sometimes it's foreign language. And they need to learn that, and I think that that's a that's a really great opportunity for community colleges to, uh, to bridge that gap. And, and although the city is actually working on some uh, really great initiatives and trying to 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 bring in additional staff through other means other than the civil service uh, system, um, it it is still quite challenging for us to try to bridge that gap of knowledge. And we're really heavy right now in uh, initiatives related to training. Uh, so that they understand and and they see themselves within that context of government and delivering those uh, those not only services to constituents to our vendors, but also trying to relate that very uh, sometimes very obscure type of uh, accounting uh, information and, and and numbers and and definitions to our or internal our own internal customers, which are other potential city departments, council offices, and 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 the. Uh, our other constituents. No, th those are great points, Miguel. And I like to kind of keep it there with you. I, I know you oversee a team of, of of over fifty professionals, so I know you touch base. Uh, but I kind of want to hear your thoughts on what your current workforce needs are. I know you mentioned some of the challenges, but um, if you can touch base on that. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, during the beginning of the pandemic, I was. And and your government usually stays behind, right? Common trends and with RPA and and AI, and it became really big, right? I even was able to actually set a, a couple of demonstrations, and I involved some of my my managers, and they were very open. They were very open, and and it was due to the to the lack of staff. A lot of people actually retired during the pandemic, and so it was very difficult for us to hire, um, just just in general, and. It was well received by the staff. However, unfortunately, there's really and 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 I hate to say this, but 
uh, in government, you know, you have very different, a, a lot of different factions. For example, you have unions and, and you have different specific classes with specific uh, duties and responsibilities. And uh, there was no appetite at that moment. There's really not a, a real appetite at this point for government to get into that area. Uh, I feel that it's still, it's a little, it might be a little challenging or it might be, um, it's a big investment in technology and, and this, it, it's, it's always a matter of priority and funding. And right now the the uh, the challenging for funding, I mean, probably most of you know what, what, the, uh, what, the, what those challenges are for the city of Los Angeles. And uh, it's not really that appetite, it's not there. I know we're gonna get there eventually. Uh, there are some areas that the city utilizes technology heavily as far as, as, far as uh, procurement, uh, but not yet. We're not there yet to actually minimize the amount of data entry, uh, the amount of uh, processes involving manual keying into our own financial system. And, and But I would really love to see that eventually, the OCR, and RPAs and trying to free up the staff's time to be able to add value to their to their careers and, and to their operations. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Bindaya, curious as we saw that KPMG is one of the highest uh, companies that are looking at usually post opening. So curious to hear your most important workforce needs and challenges currently. Yeah, I think um, as I mentioned in, in our last conversation, it's you know, while the the need is more in the accounting and tax professions, as we saw from the data, I think with the use of technology and tools that, that we are bringing to bear in our profession, what we are really looking for are, are folks who understand accounting, but understand accounting in the realm of, uh, you know, rather than looking for exceptions, really how to handle exceptions, right? So that's a very important skill set for us in terms of if you are an auditor and joining us as a new auditor today, it's not only important for you to understand the basics of accounting, but also important for you to understand how to use automation in doing your day-to-day -day job or be very comfortable in using some of these tools and templates in your day-to-day -day job. So having a good understanding of use of technology is important uh, for us. Uh, and then, um, you know, if, you, if you've taken a course related to that in, in your, uh, accounting profession that's really helpful and gives you an edge. Um, understanding of new regulations, whether it is SEC reg regulation around cyber or SEC regulation around privacy or around ESG, uh, social corporate responsibilities also, it gives you an edge up and that's important for us because these are the kind of conversations and expectations that our clients have. Mm -hmm. Um, so our largest needs are still around, you know, the entry level accounting professional, uh, but an accounting professional who's not only done an accounting degree, but has done an understanding of uh, technology, cyber, ESG in the context of accounting world. OK, no, that that's great. No, that's that's great to hear that we, we see again another trend, which is artificial intelligence and technology emerging in this specific industry. Trevor, would like to segue to you. Any additional comments? Yeah, I say from my perspective, I mean, I, I, I my perspective is more from someone who works in a tax specialty group. So we're, I think we're seeing a lot of times more and more, you know, I think in the past, the typical accounting candidate could get a more generalized experience, maybe go in, you know, through the audit, you know, through, you know, get a job as an auditor and then maybe move into tax. And then from tax could maybe move further into a specialty group or something like that. But I think we're seeing a lot more direct hiring into specialty accounting groups and, and, and specialized accounting um, roles. And, there's a there's a need for that, but it also create. I think it's a it's a it's a challenge because someone coming straight out of college is not going to have specialized experience. So um, I think that's just a just a challenge that we come across in finding people who are would be considered kind of entry level, but at the same time do have some somewhat specialized experience um, that we could at least you know, have a starting point with them when we, uh, you know, as we train them internally. Um, I think another challenge that we're coming across, it's, it just feels like it's taking longer and longer for our younger staff to get 
credentialed and to get that CPA license. And it, it could be a combination of factors, but, you know, I think just as an overall, you know, observation is that it it's taking longer and longer for that certification to, to take place. Um, and, you know, we have people just, it's a tough exam. It's, it, and it's, especially if you have a lot of, you know, heavy workload, lots of, you know, personal demands on your time. It's hard to, to get that exam taken care of. So it, those are two of the kind of bigger challenges I see um, just from my, my perspective. No, thank you, Trevor. Uh, great feedback. Ara, any uh, closing remarks on this question? I think my colleagues have covered it well, so I will allow awesome. us to move on. Yeah, I saw in the chat, Darren, I don't know if you want to unmute. I think you had a great question. I'll allow you to unmute and ask the panelists uh, that question you kind of uh, implemented on the chat. If not, I can read it for you. Sure. <clears throat> it came, uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, it came to me as a surprise, uh, the high percentage improvements 2012 through 2022, I thought, in the PowerPoint presentation on CPAs and payroll, uh, whereas a decline and or stagnation was obvious, except for one year for tax preparation. So tax prep, I would understand with all the DIY options that people have. Whereas uh, I'm a little bit surprised and the question is about payroll and uh, about CPA. Uh, jobs where the, what the root causes are for those yeah if any of the panelists want to answer that question um and what's what's driving them the growth the growth yeah so uh, Ara, i don't know if you want to take it but essentially any root causes identify with these cpa and payrolls uh trends as we see that uh they're um the ones that have the most openings? So uh, the CPA openings doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think there's been a constant demand. And I think what um, my colleagues would probably be able to re reiterate was something we were called, you know, there was this um, term during the COVID years of it was the time of the great resignation. And so you couldn't hire enough, right? And in some cases, you were looking to replace. Um, but that was because it was there was it was growing demand everywhere. I'm, I I I was struggling to think of a appropriate response to the payroll question only because that's not an area that we necessarily have huge hiring numbers in. So I, I don't think I can answer that part of the question, but the continued growth on the CPA side did not surprise me um, based on what we had been seeing over the, the the trend we've been seeing over decades, but certainly the last few years in particular. If I can do a follow-up, Jose, with sure. Ara. Ara. Uh, you're with Deloitte, Ara, and I've been an expatriate with Avery Dennison for 15 years and Deloitte has managed my tax mm -hmm. returns all mm -hmm. these years from downtown LA. Mm -hmm. uh, what about tax? Do you see that decline in your business as well? Not specifically Deloitte, but in the consulting no. slash tax preparation industry. No, we've seen growth in that area. Darren, um, specifically around kind of your area of exposure from an, as an expat, that area, I think we've seen a decline in as an impact, a direct impact of COVID for those several years, um, but not not broader than that. So um, in other spaces, continued growth, but in the kind of expat global employee services area, um, I think we saw a decline because of the there weren't there was no one traveling and no one expatriating for for a few years there. Yeah, and I would echo um, what Era just mentioned uh, as well. I think a um, couple of additions I would make is there is, of course, the pent up demand. Uh, the other is uh, there is overall, at least in the consulting firms, we are seeing a productivity loss. And when I say productivity loss, I don't mean people are working less. It's really the output that we are generating within the same amount of time because of the hybrid work environment, right? And also, as I mentioned, the we are not looking at, you know, a, a new entrant to work 100 hour weeks, which used to be a norm back in the day, right? So now people are expecting to have a good work life balance, which means that we are looking to have larger teams. And that uh, somewhat has an impact on why we have need for more auditors or more professionals on the same engagement. Um, on the payroll side, again, I would, what the trend that I've seen is a lot of organizations are 
quote unquote outsourcing their payroll function, which means you know the demand from consultants because we are providing those services to the clients. So you see the demand from us in that particular area because many organizations as they're modernizing their functions, whether it's payroll or it's finance, they are looking at to outsource those functions because these are low value functions to have within the organization. And they look at consultants uh, for those. And hence you'll see, you've seen kind of an increase or a positive trend in that particular function in terms of the job demands. Thank you, Bindaya. Um, Miguel, Trevor, um, anything you want to add? If not, we can segue to the next question. I just, I just I, want to mention, uh, sorry, Trevor. Go ahead. Uh, we do, actually, we do get some CPAs coming into us. Uh, they're certified and uh, the biggest, their biggest concern, not their biggest concern, but their biggest draw in for them is just the work-life balance. Um, unfortunately, uh, due to the issue of us being not being able to hire, and having even constraints of being able to contract some of our workout, um, that work balance uh, is really being thrown out uh, because they have to work more. And I mean, although they do get uh, uh, compensated, it's really coming back to them and, and 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 having to work a little bit more due to the lack of staffing. So it, it's it's always been the work life balance uh, appeal to in government, uh, but at this point, that trend is is really getting blurred. Trevor? I think my colleagues here have, could, have covered everything pretty well, so I think we can move on to the next topic. Awesome. Thank you so much, and, and thank you uh, for posing that question. Um, so uh, I know we mentioned uh, training credentials and certificates in high demand. And kind of segue to the next question as we saw a trend that artificial intelligence and technology is something that uh, is a need across um, all panelists here. Uh, so kind of curious, um, to hear your thoughts uh, fairly quickly on, on one of the most Im important skill sets that we hear across all industries is soft skills. So any particular soft skills that you feel are important uh, for this specific industry for success? And Trevor, I would love to start with you. Yeah, I would say just overall in terms of soft skills, I think presentation skills are very important, um, not just in person, but also you know, remotely and and through our these online tools that like we're using like like now with Zoom or you know Teams or any of those things, I think just the ability to tell a story, convey your ideas, and you know come up with actionable next steps is just a soft skill that just is is very very important and is you know definitely going to be a, a, something that would lead to success for for any new you know any new entry uh level person coming into the profession um I, again also i think writing i think i think we're seeing a lot of people shying away from from writing um you know learning that skill um i don't you know it, i guess you could also argue it's more it is a technical skill but it's also i think a soft skill in a lot of respects um not not just you know, technical writing, but also, you know, email writing, all these, all these different types of, of communication, I think are just very important. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, I think, a, 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 this idea that accounts are just crunching numbers all the time, you know, wearing those visors, and, you know, it's, it's a, you know, a boring profession in that sense. And it's, it's not, it, it requires a lot of communication, a lot of writing, a lot of, um, being able to present your ideas and convey complex topics in a way that people can easily understand. So I think those soft skills are really, really um, in high demand um, when you, for for people who come into this profession. Thank you, Bindai. I see you nodding your head, so we'd love to kind of hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think we tell all our new hires uh, exactly to Trevor's point. While there is a perception that it's a very technical field. At the end of the day, we at least, you know, RSM, Deloitte, KPMG, we are in client serving business, uh, right? No one likes to do their taxes, you have to do them. No one likes to get audited, you have to audit, uh, right? So so it's, it's like going to a doctor's office, right? No one likes going there, but if your doctor has a good bedside manner, it makes the process uh, really, really well. 
or go smoothly. So I think it's really important to have good client interaction, problem solving skills, and breaking down the problem in a manner which is empathetic and is understanding of clients' needs. Uh, I do feel like because of COVID and, and virtual education environment, some of those skills get lost because you haven't had to do a lot of those things in the real world, which you typically would. So, so folks who, are, who kind of went to college in the COVID environment are uh, somewhat at a disadvantage and need a lot more work in those soft skills areas. But regardless of AI, regardless of use of technology, no one is going to replace how you present to the client. You have to do that as a student. So I think having that level of investment in, in client management, which comes through the way of making presentations, writing good reports, um, and, and providing that you know uh, experience to the client is, is really, really important. Thank you. It's good. I'm glad to hear the different perspective from both of you and understanding that it's more than just a technical component, that there's a lot of presentation, a lot of engagement. So that's good to hear. Uh, Ara, is there anything else you want to add that the panelists haven't added? I would add a couple. And I, of course, I agree with everything that was said. So I'm going to not not go back through that. But I think um, project management, while that might sound like a technical skill, typically not in the audit and tax space, right? I mean, I think it, I'm going to categorize it more under soft skill. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and I think that kind of, I'm gonna call it the art of being able to message and that goes really closely with project management, but following up, keeping on top, providing status updates. Um, there's a soft skill there that's really critically important. And Bindia, you said it with um, our client, you know, we're a relationship management, client service, client oriented field. And those things are incredibly important. Um, the other one, um, you can either laugh at me, laugh with me, or agree with me. And, and I don't care which one, I'm still going to share um, for the reaction, which is I think that one thing, especially in this generation, this ability to provide feedback, but receive feedback has gotten lost, I'm going to say. And I think that's also incredibly important. So um, I'm just going to, those are the few things I would add. Thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, no, definitely. I, I agree with everyone. It, it, it's really critical. I really liked uh, Ara's uh, last comment. And that's something that I've, I've in, I have children, I mean, over the age of 20, 25. So, and, and, and I've noticed it. I mean, they, they, they went to school and, and, and they, they got their degrees, but the ability to relate to other people at some level, at, at some uh, at an office level, I would say, in an office environment, that's that's actually been gotten a little lost during pandemic, uh, and and that's a very that's a very necessary being able to relate to other to other people to other office workers. Uh, in our case, in my case, in, in in my office, I do see I have a, a really large. I do have the the sixth generation, <laughs> up to a certain point, the sixth generation uh, workforce. So it's very difficult for us. It's very, very challenging for me to be able to compartmentalize and be able to treat each generation and meet their needs and how they like to uh, relate to each other, relate to other groups, uh, other age groups, as well as uh, how they like to be communicated, how they like to be talked to. Um, that's actually put a lot of strain on me and, uh, as a manager. Uh, but uh, going back to what everyone was saying, it is really critical, and I agree with all these soft skills. I think they're crucial, um, and and uh, trying to create that relationship with the new workers is it, really critical, and it's it's actually uh, paid a lot of dividends on my end. No, thank you for that, Miguel. And and for the next question, I like to begin with Ara. Ara, uh, as stated by Alicia, you lead the education and workforce development pillar with Deloitte. Um, so, kind of curious to hear your thoughts on any opportunities to. Uh, upscale your current workforce, um, any professional development that you see can happen within your current workforce? So let me make sure I'm hearing the question right with our current workforce, like those that we've got on board. Um, I mean, I think the answer is yes and, right? So yes and, I think um, one, we are continuing to grow. Um, our, the demands continue to grow as we've talked about and as we've seen, um, but really we are also wanting to expand um, that growth to provide more opportunities um, for talent pools that maybe historically we haven't um, tapped into, which would be skills first and non-degree talent. So 
community college strategy, um, not, you know, those are coming in with skills. And we've really been piloting two areas, uh, developing our own apprenticeship programs, as well as um, focusing on the skills and recredentialing job descriptions, um, really focusing on uh, the non tax and audit parts of the business to start. And so the last two years, we really focused on from an advisory consulting and then our enabling areas, our internal models, um, and now looking to continue to expand um, that pilot into audit and tax as well. That's great. It, it, can you maybe take one minute to kind of touch base on what you're piloting uh, so we can have a better understanding of how, we, how that's changing what um, Deloitte is currently doing? Absolutely. So we're, um, we've, piloted and created our own um, internal apprenticeship programs um, for um, various components of our consulting business. Um, we've expanded um, uh, working with and hiring year up interns as a additional component of our apprenticeship, our growing apprenticeship programs, and then also really focused on recredentialing. So, you know, historically, and I'm going to guess it's the same with the other um, our, the other panelists in their companies as well. Um, our competitors, where it's like 98 percent, 99 percent of our workforce had degrees, and we've really revisited that to say, does that make sense? Is that required? Why? And and then recredentialing re um, degree or job descriptions that don't don't roles that don't require. To be perfectly clear, um, we will have roles that will continue to require appropriately for your degrees and beyond. However, not all of our roles needed them, and we want, want to make sure that we're allowing for those opportunities more broadly as well. No, thank you. I love that innovative way of thinking. Um, I think you're you're correct. If you want to attract a diverse pool of talent, we got to understand that some of these uh, young adults don't want to do a two-year or four-year, uh, but colleges like the ones who are here have different great programs, and I see a lot of synergy. So excited about that innovative uh, approach. Um, Trevor, um, any thoughts on um, current uh, need to upscale your workforce uh, or any professional development that you foresee the need? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, um, you know, people that I work with are all very busy. They've got lots of demands on their time. And if they do want to you know, if they do want to upskill, if they do want to, you know, learn different things, it's oftentimes um, best to be able to do it in some, you know, I think going back to that kind of hybrid environment, right, where you have, if they were looking to, you know, credential up or learn some new skills, the ability to have that that flexibility with, you know, online and, and in-person training, I think is just very helpful. Um, I mean, I think it, there's probably some element of that to, to every type of training, I think nowadays, but I think the, the, the better, um, the better, the, the, you know, the, the more offerings there are to upskill, for, you know, online or um, in a, in a hybrid environment, I think um, really is, is something that, um, will just continue to benefit us, you know, going forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Bindaya, um, any thoughts on the question? Well, I think what Ara said applies to us as well. Um, you know, we are basically re-reviewing the degree requirements for a lot of our job profiles and are working very closely with high schools, with colleges, community colleges, vocational colleges to understand how we could fill those and, and yet provide educational ongoing learning opportunities to those folks, um, including reaching out to, to different pools of uh, employees, whether it is, um, you know, ex-nurse practitioners or uh, folks who may not necessarily have taken, uh, um, I would say, a tried and tested path to consulting and accounting environment. So very similar uh, thought process and strategies are being considered by KPMG as well, as Ara mentioned. Thank you for that, Miguel. Uh, we're, well, we're, we're, we're actually currently um, utilizing uh, many uh, other resources, as other ways of bringing in uh, entrants uh, from community colleges as well from universities and the impact we, we can actually feel it. Um, they come in with the sets of skills that 
some of my staff don't even have. I mean, uh, some of these some of these uh, interns they use Chat GPT to to actually accomplish some of their some of their um, uh, assignments. Some of them uh, utilize the latest and greatest uh, uh, Excel functions uh, as well. They're very well versed in uh, Google Sheets and other other uh, applications, and they're able to complete and to be become a way more productive uh than the unfortunately than the current workforce not because they're not they don't know what's going on but because they have a lot more resistance to him to to actually go up and, and and upscale and learn new things uh but we we can actually see that and and we can see the impact uh unfortunately we do have <laughs> about few constraints to be able to provide those but uh we're little by little we're actually making strides to to make those type of uh, trainings available. Thank you for that. Thank you. For, so um, the next question uh, is a question that we've heard uh, from all the panelists say it has already impact the way they did conduct business. So I actually want to go to Bindaya. Uh, Bindaya has 18 years of experience designing innovative technology strategies to so kind of curious to hear your thoughts on how uh, technology, whether it be automation or a artificial intelligence has currently affected the workforce and the skill requirement, or if you foresee it continue to change, and in what way? Yeah, I, I mean, I am a true believer of AI being the flavor of the day, <laughs> uh, right? Which means today it's AI, tomorrow it might be another technology. But we've seen constantly how technology has changed, not just the. the employer's expectation from they come into the workforce, what kind of environment they have. Um, you know, there is a, a basic understanding of technology that is required from all the, or at least that is expected from all the new candidates that we bring into the workforce. Um, and some of the key aspects, you know, and most of these new folks who are coming into the folk, workforce are already very capable of using technology. Something like Miguel said, right? You bring on someone from uh, who's just finished their college, they already know how to use apps. They already know how to use chat GPT. They already know how to think about automation and what to expect. So if they are coming in an environment where you don't have a level of automation or don't have level of those tools and templates, it's pretty disappointing for them, right? Um, but that level of understanding is already coming into the workforce and, and is expected from the workforce who's coming in. So if you're a candidate who understands the use of technology versus a candidate who doesn't, there is clear disadvantage uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, but some of the skill sets, I think that are very helpful for professionals who come into the workforce today is um, we as employers are looking for folks who can use AI innovatively. You know, we regularly, and I'm sure it's the same for our competitors, are having competitions internally on how can we use technology to make our day-to-day -day life easier. So we do competitions, almost like hackathons, if, you, if you've kind of been part of hackathons, right? We are asking employee, uh, our, our workforce to come in and submit their ideas. And we have like shark tank type of environment where these ideas are then evaluated and we find some of the most innovative ideas, whether it is using AI, um, you know, and Miguel kind of mentioned uh, unionized environment, you know, so you're negotiating MOU and now you have to implement that in payroll environment. Can you use AI to do that? Or can you use technology to automate that process? So some of these use cases, we are asking our employees to come in and present some of those ideas. Um, so, you know, we are looking for employees who can think innovatively uh, in terms of use of technology, not only to innovate internally our processes, but also innovate processes for our clients. Um, so what it has done is created an autonomy. So it's not just a partner who's thinking about it, but it's also a new employee who's thinking about it and helping. Um, so that level of change in the workforce is expected, and, and, and we are really excited that most of these folks are coming in and have some amazing, awesome ideas on how they can use technology in, in changing their jobs uh, on day-to-day -day basis. 
No, it's great to hear directly from, from, from an industry that you guys are utilizing and you're actually doing some of the things like hackathons. So it's a skill that's already necessary and that you foresee that it's going to continue to grow. So uh, thank you for that, Ara. I, I would love to kind of hear your thoughts on that specific question. I don't know that I have much more to add. Um, I think that we're very aligned and, you know, we're excited learning together and looking at the same, looking at it the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, anything you want to add? Um, I, I'd say the, the only thing I have to add is that, you know, we, there are these, you know, the lots of innovations. There's lots of, you know, I, I think this, you know, this idea that a lot of younger people are, you know, digital natives and they, you know, know just how to use technology right out the gates. But we also find times that, you know, why they may be great with social media or using Google and YouTube and all these other tools that, you know, some things just like, you know, doing basic formulas in Excel, they may like there's a gap <laughs> sometimes and they just don't know how to use some of these basic tools that we use in our everyday uh, work environments. So um, I, I think, yeah, it's important to think to the future and, you know, we really want to encourage you know, the, these, these using these tools and being innovative, but also understanding the basics of, you know, certain things like, I, you know, Excel is a, is a tool we all use every day, all the time. And just having basic knowledge of Excel, I think is, is something that can set apart um, people coming into the, into the profession. Um, so that's just that's one thought I had, yeah. No, that's a great point. Uh, understanding the roots of, uh, you know, Excel, just, you know, making sure that you fully understand how to utilize it. I think it's definitely beneficial. Uh, Darren, you have your hand raised with a lot of... Yeah, I'm not a panelist, but if you allow me to just quickly share my thought there, uh, Jose, uh, there's a lot of hype about AI, about the benefits of AI, and that's in the academic environment and the education industry. My concern is it might be a major impediment to learn some basic things, and we're not properly addressing that. In the industry, I'm doing it on my own. I'm trying to benchmark. I'm trying to look at best practices, but it's mostly uncharted territory since ChatGPT became open source as of November 2022. So I'm struggling, not that I'm struggling, we're struggling uh, with the students who constantly copy-paste stuff how are they going to learn the things? How will they know what they don't know to learn and apply it in the industry? Because I don't think they know what they don't know. And I'm not saying that from a facetious and or condescending approach. I'm saying that from an educational standpoint. So I hear 95% hype about what AI will do for us in terms of good news. I don't hear enough at all, personally, with all my readings and so on what AI is causing as havoc or might be causing as havoc. Just my thoughts in, you know, in a very rudimentary way. Darren, I'm just going to react it by saying that's super interesting because I think, um, and I'll just say me personally, not, not representing the industry or anything else, but me personally really hears a lot of the negative, which is why I wanted to start with, I think there's an equalizer and a positive opportunity here. So the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle um, and and you you might be happy about my extreme, and I'm happy about your extreme. So, um, but 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 you're right. I mean, listen, um, in an industry where quality means everything, and quality is our brand, what not knowing what you don't know, and not asking the right questions of a human, of ChatGPT or anywhere else, is always going to be the number one concern. And so, your 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 concern and worry, I think, is appropriate and one that we're all going to share with you, but I think along with, but, but I would say personally, I, I've heard more of the negatives, which also concern me. Right. And so there's a balance to that. Bindi, I saw you come off mute. I don't know if you're going to agree or disagree, but I'm looking forward to your comments. No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I agree to both all three of you. One of the things that I continue to, to experience is why you can teach the new technology. And as I keep saying, AI being the flavor of the day to anyone, you can't teach the attitude mm -hmm. of learning to, to the student, right? Um, so I think to Darren, your point, it is very important that the students of today and the workforce of today come in with curiosity and attitude to learn. 
you may not know everything and i don't believe there is an expectation for you to know everything uh but if you don't even have that perspective of hey i could be wrong hey there is something for me to learn here you no one can teach you that no training course can teach you that and i think that's that's that basic uh requirement that any profession has that you you come in with curiosity and attitude to learn thank you for that thank you darren for for that comment uh miguel love to hear any final remarks uh well i, I completely agree with everyone and and i I hear there and, and I go back to Pandia's comment regarding the disappointment that when you actually beef up your skills and you're not, you have no place to actually deploy those skills, uh, it, it can be very disappointing. However, I think that if employers, even, even the city of LA, even governmental entities, they can actually encourage employees to become innovative and to deploy some of those new skills and those new new tools in their day to day and how they can become more productive and how they can actually, it, it, it adds up. And I think that it, it, it adds up in the, in the overall productivity of an enterprise. Uh, I think that would be a great, a great thing, but everyone's it's the, just the comments are amazing. I'm so glad that I'm here. No, thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a great discussion on AI, but we'd love to segue uh, to the next question. And, and one of the most important things that I think we got to work on based on the data that uh, is building equitable pipelines. We see that 50% uh, of the industry is uh, made up of Caucasian. So uh, there's a lot of room for diversity here. Um, so we'd love to pass it on to my colleague, Alicia, who will close us off with building equitable and talent pipelines uh, portion of the panel. Thanks, Jose. Yeah, um, as Jose mentioned, we really want to strive for diversity and inclusion. So with that, I kind of wanted to ask, um, how can programs better address diversity and inclusion within the accounting and tax industry? Um, Trevor, let's start with you. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I was looking at the demographic breakdown and all, you know, and I, I think there are a lot of, still a lot of challenges and a lot of a lot of inroads to make when it comes to, to diversity and inclusion. But I think this profession in particular, it has, there's a very unique opportunity, I think, for, for everyone to, to come into it. And I think part of the problem, I think, is just our branding and our marketing to younger people. But frankly, I think we have a, I think we have to make it we have to make it more exciting to become to get into the accounting world, and we have to we have to market ourselves and brand and, and brand ourselves more as than just these boring accounting people who just crunch numbers all day. I I think that's going to make inroads to attracting all sort you know more diverse talent, more you know people from all all walks of life, and not just you know what what we've historically seen it, which is you know predominantly I think white and asian people coming into the profession I, I i think we're i think we are making some some inroads i i think we there's a lot to go you know there's a lot further to do but i think fundamentally to to just get everyone you know more interested in the in the um in the profession we have to tell these stories of 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 what is interesting about our jobs and what we do that's that that is 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 exciting and gets us you know, out of bed every day, you know, to go to work. So th those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. Now that I completely agree with you, I think perception and storytelling is really important to convey those. Um, so I kind of would, would love to hear your take on it, Bindia. Yeah, I think, um, I completely agree with Trevor's uh, point of view here as well. Um, you know, what we've done, uh, and, and I'm sure it's the same across the board, is really looked at the root cause of why there is a quote-unquote lack of diversity. And, and I know we are doing better now than we were maybe a few years ago. And, and that's where you see some of our strategies are, you know, the biggest issue was pipeline. Where were we going to hire the students, right? Um, and we were typically going to top 10 colleges and hiring from there. And um, you know, as we all know, the, the diversity in top 10 colleges is usually white or Caucasian Asian population. So we've changed that and said, OK, let's let's start looking at where are we going to hire um, and, and are we specifically looking for degree 
students, right? Do all professions or all jobs in our in our organization need that? We are also going to the um, high schools um, as well as um, you know middle schools to understand and create that perception of what do we do. So we are creating internship programs to to kind of give the students visibility into what does it look like. So we have an Embark program with LAUSD, for example, where we get the interns from them for summer uh, and they get to see what do we do on a day-to-day basis. Um, we are working with a lot of not-for-profit organizations as well to provide and change that level of perception. And the final thing we'll say, I'll say is, you know, going to the uh, vocational schools, um, to hire specifically for certain industries and certain profiles has also helped in addressing um, some of the diversity challenges, not just in terms of ethnicity, but also in terms of diversity of thought. I think one of the things that we also noted was um, a lot of us consultants and us accounting professionals thought the same way, right? So we needed that diversity of thought in terms of how do we approach a problem? How do we address an issue? So when we looked at the root causes, some of the strategies we deployed were, you know, let's go to high school. So let's start right from the high, high school and middle school. Let's go to some of the other employment pools rather than just looking at the same colleges year on, year in, year out, um, and going to them to hire the professionals. No, that's a really great point. I think exposure and awareness and that repetitive exposure and awareness is really key to getting uh, more talent pipeline within that. Um, Miguel, would love to hear your take on that as well. Uh, yes, I think that even even personally, uh, it's it's quite scary. I mean, for for students to be actually put a benchmark, and I understand that the understanding of of and the and the and the mastery of technical skills in the accounting is is crucial. It's necessary for you to be able to. To continue your learning process, however, it is it is it can be quite put off for some some uh, some students, and I would say it like that um, to meet a certain threshold. And I think that the uh, the the approach at some of um, some of the some of my colleagues they mentioned their in their in their industries particular areas is really critical to bring in the diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, uh, also experiences, uh, and and they need. I think that the creation of role models, mentorship programs, that's really critical. Uh, and the city, we actually do have some initiatives. Unfortunately, um, it, it's it's difficult to rewrite what's always been the norm. Uh, uh, let's let's say like this position descriptions that certain groups, not certain groups, but certain classifications cannot do certain work without the the certain requirements uh, and that's that takes process and, and that would actually open up the the uh, the field to many more groups. Uh, it is it is really critical. Uh, it, it's it's once you you reach that threshold to under and, and to really reap the benefit and the uh, the richness and and uh, of of experiences and and uh, the 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 thought the diversity of thought in, in everyone and and all the employees I, I, you see that synergy you see, you see that 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 actually develops into a, a greater more more uh, happy workforce uh, and those those will be my thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing, Miguel. Um, so we want to be really cognizant of the time so that you're able to also engage with some of the faculty. So I'll leave it with the last question, which is how can community colleges help you address the workforce gaps and needs? I know that was kind of already addressed, but within that, we kind of also want to segue into what does the ideal accounting and tax curriculum, what, what would that look like to you? Um, let's start with Adia, please. Yeah, I'll summarize. I mean, I think we had a lot of discussion um, around that, but I, to me, you know, three things. One's the, the soft skill or the aptitude, attitude part of the process. You're a student who's willing to learn, who's willing to learn lifelong uh, and is willing to take the feedback. Um, you know, things can be taught as long as you're willing uh, to come in and learn. Of course, basics of accounting and you know basics of of the specific job profile, whether it's tax accounting or technology audit, um, that that's critical. Um, and um, 
the last point I'll say is around, you know, attitude and aptitude around use of technology is, is critical in today's world. It doesn't have to be AI, it doesn't have to be RPA, but just a perspective on that technology can make life better uh, while keeping in mind the risks that it brings um, and, and addressing those. But those are, I would say, a good candidate profile um, in terms of courses, I mean, you know, we hire from community college and, you know, I actually have some members on my team who come from Los Angeles Community College. Uh, and then I've looked at the the courses that, that they have. And I, I, I am actually very impressed, right, you know, at, at what those students bring uh, to the table. But as long as those three things can be addressed in, in the curriculum, that would be really helpful. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Miguel, would love to hear your insight on that as well. Um, I, I think I would agree with India that the, uh, the technical skills, also the soft skills, but also the the lifelong learning mentality of, of, of the students. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's a combination. And I think that uh, if, if community colleges will be able to, to actually bridge that and may and contextualize is not only that this is tax this is auditing and but make it as a whole i mean how is this can actually make an organization an enterprise a government a nonprofit better how can you utilize those numbers how can you actually see it as more of a business process uh, driven instead of uh, compartmentalizing its specific function cost accounting like for example how is that actually driving that can potentially drive the operation or how can actually you can find uh, ways that um, it, it, it uh, to to make changes. Um, uh, soft skills, technical skills, uh, do a little bit more of, 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 for example, what Trevor mentioned, even skills on how to conduct remote meetings, how to be effective, how to project management. I think uh, Era mentioned that, uh, although it might be a little, Oh, how do you call that? Uh, intimidating at first, but I think that once uh, you have that that good base, good knowledge, and good uh, good um, set of technical skills, I think that that can make a big big difference for candidates coming into the workforce, and they can actually be able to apply them. I think more case studies, more business cases, and and to that 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 can actually make a big difference. Those are all really great points, um, especially for those specific skills. Um, Trevor would love to hear your insight on that as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think what the community colleges do really well, and that, that can where they can continue to, you know, thrive in this area is really like tailored curriculum for you know end goal you know, hit the workforce type of, of, of students. Right. So like when I was, when I was, when I went back to community college to sit for the CPA exam, my goal was to take, you know, very specific courses that would help me prepare for the CPA exam. And I had a goal in mind and, you know, I had the, had the end in mind and was able to reach that goal, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty fast, efficiently. And luckily, you know, the community college system is, one of the greatest bargains, I think, in the history of education. So, I mean, it was, you know, I was able to do it very cost effectively as well. And so I think whatever, so I think definitely having that, you know, th that in mind that a lot of these students, I think, will often be looking for to really be able to hit the ground running when they are done with their curriculum or, you know, or look to grow within their their current role and expand and and have certain you know phases of their career where you know maybe maybe the the curriculum maybe they're just new to a payroll function and you know let's let's have a you know a very tailored curriculum for them for something involving payroll and maybe if they're looking later on to get a degree or sit for the CAPA exam that there's these these types of programs where they can really like take it off the shelf and take, you know, and, 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 and attack those, those courses and, you know, within a year or two be, be ready to, to be in the profession. I think that is, 
incredibly valuable and um, something that the, the community college system can, can do and continue to do quite well. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, or I see that you're back. So the question that we kind of wanted to end with was how can community colleges help um, address your workforce gaps and needs, but what does the ideal accounting and tax curriculum, what would it look like to you? So I thank you, and I'm sorry I had to step aside. And it sounds like it was like it was a great conversation. Um, I I missed out on um, what I heard. I agree with um, one of the things that I know we've kind of gotten some exposure to, both with Europe, but also in the New York CUNY systems in particular. That I'll kind of double down on for a moment um, is that opportunity while going to school to also have this a side apprenticeship, pro, you know, kind of a program um, with the business because I think that's gonna really help get them um, off the ground running differently. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that's been considered, but any kind of opportunity, any length, I think just that exposure, um, I think what we have found um, through research, so um, is that so many that maybe are not getting four-year degrees also don't have the exposure to corporate America at home. And so giving them a, an added benefit, that added benefit or what our interns would typically get, um, Bindia, wouldn't you agree, um, could really be helpful in, in them getting their foot, you know, getting the foot in the door. But once they are out of the community college and if they're starting work to really be able to hit the ground running differently. No, that's a great point, especially being practical and having them have that experience already will lead them right into the job itself. Um, thank you so much for sharing. So we kind of wanted to leave time for um folks to be able to engage with the employers that we have here. For any faculty, please, if you want to write it in the chat or just raise your hand, feel free to engage so as well. Yeah, we'd love to kind of have some of the faculty unmute and kind of engage with, with the panelists. As we saw, we, we had some great feedback. So the floor is yours, faculty and deans. And I know there were some questions um, asked if you guys are a bit shy we can go through there but uh, if you want to unmute why I read it and, and kind of go from there but the question I was kind of asked um, how can colleges collaborate more effectively with industry partners to ensure that students receive practical experience um, so we'd love to open up to any of the panelists that want to um, answer that question and then if there's a faculty that presented that question that wants to dive deeper please feel free to unmute I'll, I'll start with that. I, I think, you know, we are always looking for interns, people who, you know, can get that, that internship experience and looking for candidates that we could, you know, get into our inter internship program. So I think to the extent that um, faculty at the, you know, any of the community colleges recognizes or you know has interactions with with students that they think are good internship candidates that those are all that's always a good um i think gateway to the to the profession and you know something that we are always looking for and you know oftentimes our interns become our you know will become our next you know group of of new hires so it's um it's definitely a a a pathway to the profession through the internship process yeah, I mean, maybe uh, to add to that, I'll say the two ways I've seen a good collaboration between us and, and some of the colleges is, you know, one, we have a, um, for example, for one, one of the schools that we work with, we have a quarterly meeting with their professors and the dean to kind of help provide inputs into the program, um, you know, and, and help they kind of bring their program design to us and we help them um, in understanding what's coming from whether it is a regulator or from what we are seeing in the industry and kind of have that ongoing collaboration. Um, and the other thing to Ara's point, I think from earlier, um, you know, we provide the internship opportunities, of course, now there, there are those summer internship programs, but we are also trying to design some of the more innovative internships which is not necessarily commitment for three months or four months, but hey, you come in for two weeks, get an insight into what the corporate world looks like and, and go from there. 
Um, and the third thing is guest speaker program. Uh, again, I, I'm sure you all have that already in place, but bringing in guest speakers on regular basis so the students get insights into uh, you know, what the real world looks like, what the real case studies look like is always helpful as well in absence of uh, uh, an internship program. So I've seen all of, all three of those work uh, in, in collaborating with the colleges. Thank you for that. So again, I want to urge the uh, faculty and deans, if they have a question to raise your hand or you can unmute or drop it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'll keep reading some of the questions that were posed during registration. So uh, again, for any of the panelists, how can College Career Center support employers to help provide training and onboarding for new hires? Jose, repeat the question one more time. Of course, yeah. So how can College Career Centers support employers to help provide training and onboarding for new hires? So I don't know if the person who presented that question is here. If you want to unmute and kind of uh, dive deeper into that question. Um, but my understanding uh, is, um, of course, as we all know, the colleges have career centers. Uh, so I think your question is kind of asking how we can uh, support the employers um, to provide training um, for the new hires uh, that they're onboarding. Is that correct? Anyone? And with the career center, and and if I'm misunderstanding, which is why I asked for you to repeat the question, I mean, I think the the most important um, portion is helping them get to the employer potential employers, right? So helping with the resumes, helping with um, interview readiness, I think is so critical. But then making sure that they know of all the opportunities, and if they're not getting responses, um, and to my fellow panelists, keep me honest, but um, help push them to push on us a little bit more. Um, so the follow-ups and and kind of the, the spirit of owning your own career starts before you've started your career, you know, do the follow-up and and don't take no answer as an answer. No, that, that that's great feedback, Ara. Um, I actually have a question here uh, that I think is a great question because we see that a lot with international students. So um, can experience and education in the accounting field from another country be used to qualify for positions uh, within um, any of your guys' firms? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, go ahead, India. I was going to say I'm an immigrant myself. I came from India and my accounting degree is, was from India. So, uh, you know, I, it is very transferable, of course, you know, for you have to do your CPA and all of that, which is relevant to the country. But the basics of accounting are very similar, right? What balance sheet looks like, what it's pretty transferable from, from all of that aspect. Um, and I think uh, applying and just to, to the point Dara mentioned, having a career center helps you translate that and articulate that in a manner which is, is going to be really helpful uh, so that you know the employer can see how that skill set is transferable along with the additional education that you might have attained in, in, in the US environment. No, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your, your personal experience. Trevor, we'd love to hear your thoughts um, and perspective. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I think, I mean, we we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of needs and a lot of, uh, you know, people that, you know, come from other countries. Um, I think accounting in general, the, the you know, lends itself to that better. Um, I think some of the challenges, I think, oftentimes with people who come from other countries are not necessarily that the technical aspects of accounting or technology, oftentimes they're, it's, you know, quite good, you know, what we find. But um, I think the, the, what, Come, becomes an issue or or a challenge is is the language you know language skills and so you know I think again it comes back to you know the, these language and writing skills and things of that nature I think so, sometimes that that is a, a bigger challenge for someone who's coming from another country and so I think to the extent that um, you know anyone who is 
from uh, another country that is looking to enter this profession know that one, they're not alone. They have, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be welcome, but, you know, at the same time, the, you know, if they're looking to focus on their skill set and really being able to, to, to succeed in a, in, in the accounting industry, um, the mastery of the language and, and the writing and, the, and all those things is, is going to be very important. Yeah, I think I, I would just simply add, while I agree with all that, relevant work experience is relevant work experience. Um, and in the area, specifically in the tax field, um, you know, taxes in another country may not transfer exactly. However, we all now have um, groups working, you know, with us in the, for, with, on U.S. taxation in other countries, including India. And so um, I think that that becomes real, much more transferable and really easily transferable. And then we, we see a lot of that kind of movement happen. So absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Miguel, curious to hear the, the, the side of the city um, uh, in regards to this question. Um, no, I, it, it, it's great. Uh, it is, it is, uh, it's not a, that's not a barrier. Uh, as long as uh, a, a, a person's degree, it can be actually validated, uh, can be, how do you call that? I forgot the actual term. Um, that's not an issue. Uh, I do, we do have actually plenty of, of um, employees that have vast experience um, in finance and banking industries in other countries, um, Asia. And um I would agree with Trevor. In, in some cases, uh, language and and writing skills can do present a, a quite a quite a challenge. It, it, it can become very frustrating, not only for the person receiving that information, but also for the person trying to provide that information, trying to make them see. Because we, I mean, accountants understand accountants, right? I mean, you don't have to translate that. So now, trying to imagine. Uh, imagine trying to translate the accounting terminology, the, account, uh, the accounting jargon into from uh, in, in another language, from another set of uh, cultural values. It's 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 quite difficult, and and, uh, and and that can that can lend itself to a lot of frustrations and a lot of misunderstandings. But it's uh, the city is very it's super inclusive. It's not that's not a problem. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I, I'm dealing with with the sixth generation gap <laughs> in, in, in a lot of cases, so that's not that's not a problem. But uh, I'm I'm really happy to hear that everyone's on the same on the same uh, challenge, uh, but also on the same way to and on the same boat to actually look for solutions. And 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 I'm I'm really glad that there's there's a resource, a really the vast resource to actually provide us with a a, a qualified pool of candidates and and. I will make sure that we start looking into potential um, partnerships and 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 looking more into this this type of resource. No, thank you, Miguel, and thank you for the panelists for for that great feedback. There was actually a follow up question by Kenny. Kenny, feel free to un unmute yourself. But um, question is, does work experience in other countries count as well? I know Bindaya, you added some of your feedback. I don't know if you want to uh, voice that out for the entire group. Yeah, I think Kenny's question was whether the global experience uh, counts uh, or, or experience working in other countries count. And I think uh, to our point before, relevant work experience is relevant work experience, uh, pretty transferable. In fact, we have many jobs where global experience is an advantage because, you know, you're serving a client that has global presence and need an understanding of how accounting regulations work in India versus UK versus uh, U.S. right, so that global experience can be a big advantage from from that perspective as well. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, one more time. Um, any other questions from uh the attendees? Um, feel free to drop it in the chat, uh, or unmute. Um, Kenny, I see your hand raised, so the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you so much, um, and thank you for having this great meeting. I'm actually, you know, um, just following through on that previous question I posted because uh, most of my students are, you know, immigrants, people who just arrived, and some of them have accounting degrees, uh, and they start off in the non-credit area, and we do have certificate of completions in the non-credit area. So now, Based on that, um, how can they stay competitive or be able to compete with those that have advanced degrees here? You know, they have their degrees in their home countries and experience in the area 
of accounting or entrepreneurship in their home country, but they just starting over here with, you know, um, getting this non-credit uh, courses. So how can they stay or what advice would can I give those students um, so that they could stay, compete with those who actually have bachelor's degree, master's degree here? So, so I, maybe I'll share two cents here, um, and I think it continues to be, I'll say, work in progress. I, I don't think it needs. I don't think the ideal state is that we find ourselves in a position where we have those with maybe not non degrees fighting for positions with those with degrees. And I think it really is on us as employers to really identify different talent paths um, and opportunities. To, to hire both and provide both sets of talent um, with the right career opportunities and and the right challenges and opportunities. So it doesn't feel like it's, it's because I think that's, how do I say this? I'm gonna just say it bluntly. I think that's how it's been, right? And that's kind of how we found ourselves in a position where over 99% of our people have degrees. And that's really the, what we want. We want to look at differently and impact differently and allow opportunities and pathways differently. And so it's gonna be on us as employers to not have that be viewed as a competitive situation, but really parallel paths of opportunity. Um, Kenny, does that help? Yes, certainly it does help, you know, because I do have, you know, and I see it from a faculty perspective where I see that they have the great skills, but they're lacking a, a degree. So they're finding themselves, um, you know, struggling with finding, you know, a job in that area. So they just end up in something else while, you know, they have to revalidate all of their, you know, studies here. So it it could take like another four years between they start, you know, practicing again. So, um, so it really gives me, you know, um, your, you know, what you mentioned just gives me a different, um, I guess mentality, how to promote this, you know, to the students, how to make sure that they stay motivated to apply because some of them just get scared and don't apply at all. So, um, thank you so much for the information. No, and that, that's never the best answer, right? So, um, even mm -hmm. if you, it, you, you never know until you try, right? And, but, but if you don't try, the answer is no uh, off the bat. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I know, and I think Trevor mentioned this, but we really value the faculty recommendation. So if you've got students of, of that caliber where you believe that strongly in, um, the, the words you can share, the reach outs you can do on their behalf go a long way as well. Yeah. Okay, and, thank you and, so much. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think I mean, you know, it's for for us, it's it's hard to know exactly when we hire a candidate if they're going to be able to, you know, do the do the job. You know, we're we're doing our doing our best to assess, you know, what their skills and and expertise and all these things are. So, I mean, to the extent that they have experience, they have knowledge that was, you know, from a, from another country and that they're, you know, trying to make inroads here. Um, the better that they can convey that, the more that they've, they've, they're able to communicate that and, and tell that story to um, prospective employers, I think is, is invaluable. So I think, you know, getting, having them get in front of people who are those decision makers at, at firms and companies I think is 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 one way to really um you know uh, show that they they can that they can thrive. No, thank you so much. Would love to um final question while Alicia launches our poll. Um maybe 30 seconds for all the panelists and we can start with you Trevor. Uh final thoughts, 30 seconds on overall how we can continue to work together with the community colleges or what you see your action items are. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think just, you know, definitely events like this um, and also just making, making us aware of what you guys are doing and the programs that you're, 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 you're offering and, you know, sharing those stories you have about your students and, and just keeping us, keeping us informed. I mean, like I said, everybody, you know, everybody's very busy, right? So if we don't hear, you know, 
what what you guys are doing and and what you know is 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 coming across your your plate you know we won't necessarily know so the the more you make us aware of 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 what's going on i think the better off you know we'll all be to you know make sure that this this uh, partnership just continues to grow thank you so much Mindaya. Oh, I'll echo Trevor's uh, comments as well. Uh, I mean, for me, California Community Colleges is our client. So the success of your students is our success. Um, and it's really important that we continue to collaborate with you all in building meaningful courses for the students so they can be successful as well. Um, so whatever we can do, whether it is, you know, uh, collaborate with you all, create internship opportunities, um, just reach out and we can work on on pilot programs or otherwise on, on best efforts to to move forward. But this is a great great uh, session to to go, to at least initiate some of that collaboration. Thank you so much, Ara. I, I will just echo all of that and say in a future session, would love to have um, to spend a little time talking about MADE as well, a program that we've created, okay. making accounting um, diverse and equitable um, to provide opportunities for students to continue on um, their educational journey. So that could be a, a follow-up topic if anyone's interested as well. But thank you so much. Thank you. And then Miguel, lastly, any comments? Um, just, uh, it, it, it's wonderful, wonderful to hear the, the, the insights and, and, and it's really, really encouraging to see how big firms, uh, the big firms actually in accounting, they're willing to, or they're, they're, they're continuously trying to, uh, do that innovation to bring down those barriers that can, can be, can be difficult for, for some of the students, right. But on our end in government, um, we're trying to be as, as inclusive as possible, create as many programs that we can actually create paths and 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 see these uh, so that these students can see that government is also another option. Uh, and, and also, like somebody mentioned, it's, it's more of a skill base. It could be potentially skill based. So it's a, the, the barrier is not as, as difficult to come in uh, or as scary as, as, uh, as uh, for some of the students. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then I just kind of want to reiterate, thank you so much again for our panelists. Uh, we will follow up. Thank you to Los Angeles Regional Consortium, uh, Luke at Center of Excellence, and thank you for all the faculty and deans in attendance. Once again, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much.